breath we come, pausing with expectancy, posing questions, praying dreams, gathering courage, hope, and faith. Circle you hold life indeed, with thanksgiving. Welcome everybody. Tonight, before we explore the history of Lawrence, I'd like to offer a brief recap of two questions. What is this ancient pattern of the labyrinth? And why are so many people around the world embracing its return to our contemporary lives? As you know, the labyrinth is generally circular in form enclosing a pattern of spiraling and twisting turns leading to a center. Labyrinths are unicursal, meaning there is only one path leading to the center, and the same path is walked in reverse from the center back out. Paths are called circuits. And conversely, mazes are different in that they are multicursal, meaning they have many paths and are intentionally designed to present choices, false turns, blind alleys, and they are created to confuse the mind and get you lost. <laughs> but labyrinths are designed to bring you to clarity and to help you find your way and inspire insight. As I quoted last week, in the labyrinth, you don't lose yourself, you find yourself. So this orderly design leads us to a center of rest and before going back out along the same orderly path. This journey allows the rational mind to relax so the experience can stir the more deeply intuitive and receptive aspects of the heart. And in this fragmented world, this meets a deep longing that many of us have it is essentially a walking meditation or a prayer walk and is helpful for those who struggle with sitting meditation or for those who feel called to this form of a more embodied contemplative practice of movement. There are many names for the labyrinth, a metaphor for life, a bridge between heaven and earth, a crucible of change, an inner pilgrimage, a journey of transformation, an archetype or blueprint for wholeness, a portal to the true self, a gateway to the heart, a path to the sacred center, a place where psyche can engage with spirit. There are so many ways to describe the labyrinth as a symbolic process. In her book, Lauren Archers writes, Walking a Sacred Path, so kind of the Bible of the labyrinth world. She writes, why does the labyrinth attract people? Because it's a tool to guide healing, to deepen self-knowledge, and empower creativity. Walking the labyrinth clears the mind and gives insight into the next steps on the spiritual journey. It calms us in the throes of life transitions and helps us see our lives more in the context of a journey. She says, we realize we are not merely human beings on a spiritual path, but spiritual beings on a human path, to paraphrase Teilhard de Chardin. Now I'm gonna dive into labyrinth history but I have to say there are, are 30 slides here. So uh, in order to stay within my given time, I'll have to move briskly. If you have some questions, I would really appreciate it if you would talk to me after the presentation so I can cover all of it without breaking it up. Um, 
So fasten your seat belts. Put up your tray tables. I was a flight attendant in the 70s, and, and making that announcement was really ingrained in my brain. Now I'm in my 70s, and I'm still making that announcement. So uh, don't anybody blink. Here we go. Uh, let's go back, way back, to the earliest forms of labyrinths, or even labyrinth-like patterns. Humans carved spirals and concentric circles on rock walls as early as 12,000 BC. And just for the record, tonight I'll be using BC and AD. I know that there are other BCE and CE, but I'm going to use these because the creator, the labyrinth scholar who created this program, uses those throughout, and so I'm going to stay with that. And I'm also going to say Shark Cathedral. I know a lot of people say Chartres Cathedral, but I'm going to be using BC, AD, and Chart. Just so get that clear right now. Okay, so humans have carved spirals and concentric circles on rock walls as early as 12,000 BC. So for early peoples, the earth was their canvas. We all recognize this circle as a universal symbol of unbroken unity, wholeness, eternity, the primordial everything. Swiss psychiatrist Carl Jung saw the circle as the symbol of the essential self, the greater wholeness beyond our ego identity. Humans have an innate sense of a circular, a spiraling, cyclical nature of life. And the spiral appears in nature in so many forms. It's in water currents, it's in plant growth patterns, it's in shells, it's in parts of our bodies, the very heavens above, seen by early man, and seen even more distinctly today. The spiral is a basic organic element of creation. So these two shapes were likely the inspirations for the development of labyrinths. After all, most labyrinths are spirals bound by a circle. The history of labyrinths is filled with twists and turns and mysterious origins and evolutions, not unlike the design itself. Although labyrinths have taken a variety of forms, and have been constructed in many different materials, they are recognizable immediately. And the pattern is found throughout the world, having been known and used from antiquity to the present. Labyrinths can be traced back over 4,000 years in many cultures. Let's look at how they have developed over the centuries. I've spoken about the difference in labyrinths and mazes. Here is an 11 circuit Roman style labyrinth. And see how similar it looks to this British hedge maze design. Yet the labyrinth has a single path to its center while the maze is essentially a cognitive puzzle. As I mentioned last week, in ancient times, the words labyrinth and maze were interchangeable. And although the labyrinth has established its own identity as having a single path to the center, today the terms are still often used incorrectly. If you Google labyrinth, or if you search Amazon books, the word labyrinth is applied to everything from economics to literary and cultural studies to relationships, to corporate entanglements, to <laughs> global politics, to plumbing and wiring. But what is generally implied there is more the definition of a maze, not a true labyrinth. Really gotta get that clear. I think I did. So the first known labyrinths were petroglyphs in Northwest Spain. Everybody see okay? They were dated around 2000 BC. <clears throat> Similar labyrinth petroglyphs in Italy 
are dated 750 to 500 BC, the lower ones. You can definitely see the concentric circles leading to the center. Early labyrinths, um, early examples of the labyrinth symbol are on a uh, Greek clay tablet dated 1200 BC, a clay ceramic bowl from Syria around 1200 BC, a labyrinth petroglyphs in Rock Valley, England, possibly 1200 BC, age is a little uncertain on that, and uh, an inscription in a burial chamber in Sardinia, Italy, possibly 200, 200 BC. Classical labyrinths, we're in the category now of classical. All of the early labyrinths have the same design and are called the classical labyrinth. Typically they had seven concentric circles around the center. They're often called Cretan labyrinths, so that's it's the same. If you hear Cretan labyrinth, that's a classical. Um, a few examples were uh, found with as many as uh, 15 circuits. <coughs> and some drawn in square form. Now, I'll mention here that labyrinths can be right-handed or left-handed, meaning the first turn that you make is either to the right or to the left. Uh, this square uh, labyrinth is a right-handed square, so you see that first path. Are you getting the... Yeah, <laughs> yeah so you see there's the first... It, it, it's unusual, most, most labyrinths are left-handed. That's a little detail I thought I'd point out. <laughs> Greek and Roman. Well, historically, the most well-known labyrinth originated in Greek mythology and was built by the architect Daedalus for King Minos of Greece, of Crete, Crete, to house and restrain the half-bull, half-man beast, the Minotaur. The legend of Theseus venturing into the center of that labyrinth to slay the monster has long been related to labyrinth lore. Before venturing in, Theseus was given a thread by Ariadne, the king's daughter, to carry with him in order to trace his path back out after battling the Minotaur. This thread motif became a metaphor for the guidance that is provided for the labyrinth journey to triumph over darkness. But by the way, this Cretan labyrinth that Theseus went into, it was technically a maze, or otherwise he wouldn't have needed a thread. Uh, <laughs> thread. So that goes back to uh, why I say the terms were used interchangeably, but I just have to get that clear. Because... <laughs> okay, so we're, here we are uh, with a, a Greek coin from around 300 BC, coins issued from Crete had the labyrinth symbol signifying that legendary event. And then um, Roman pavement labyrinths often featured uh, Theseus and the Minotaur in the center. The popularity of the Theseus and Minotaur story through Greek and Roman times ensured the spread of the labyrinth symbol far and wide. From the first to the fifth centuries BC, Romans created labyrinth patterns on floors, walls, on many objects, even the way they laid out some towns. Its geometric form was popular in homes, often in the entryway, and was thought of as a form of protection for the owners of the home, as well as the guests. These floor tiles were found throughout the Roman Empire from Portugal to Cyprus, northern England to North Africa. Many were square, or some circular surrounded by spirals, and they often held, you know what, the Minotaur. <laughs> <laughs> and this one, let me get it large. It's really hard to see, but there's a scene of the battle going on there in the center. So, that legend persists. Early Christian labyrinths, the earliest known labyrinth laid, laid in a Christian church was in Algeria uh, around 384 AD in recognition of Christianity becoming the official religion of the Roman Empire. So this square shows the Roman influence because there, there's where most of the square. 
And it depicts, gotta show you, the thread. <laughs> There's Ariadne's thread. Leading in from the entrance. Is that visible? Yeah. 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 Okay. And the center uh, contains the words Sancta Ecclesia, Ecclesia, which means Holy Church. And it's sort of a word puzzle. It looks like something that would be in the New York Times <laughs> these days. Uh, so I don't know the story on that. Interesting. Okay, manuscript labyrinths. I'm especially interested in manuscript labyrinths because these illustrations are so fascinating. Um, from about 500 AD, labyrinth drawings flourished and evolved through the spread of hand-copied manuscripts that circulated around the Christian monasteries and the royal courts of Europe. There was no email with attachments. <laughs> so, I mean, this is a thousand years before the printing. So this is how things got created and, and spread around. Uh, many of these manuscripts were illustrated and the labyrinth symbol was very popular. Now the scribes who created the manuscripts had to copy the text perfectly, but they were often at liberty to embellish and develop their own illustrations on the page margins or on blank pages. <coughs> this one at the top is an 11th circuit um, labyrinth seen in a French manuscript from the early 900s. Um, over here, this one's very elaborate. It's a uh, Sixth Circuit labyrinth in an English manuscript from about 1030. It's just beautiful. It's, um, it's only six circuits, but it's quite elaborate. These are the kind of manuscripts that I'm diving into studying more. And some of the manuscripts have, this isn't in my script, but I'm gonna throw it in. Uh, they have these interesting um, designs around the opening of the labyrinth. They'll have like gateways, elaborate gateways and doorways. And so there's several different research papers on uh, the meaning of, of those special entrances to the labyrinth in these manuscripts. Uh, this one down below is 11th Circuit um, labyrinth on a manuscript from Austria in the 1100s. Look what's in the middle. Yeah. Uh, I don't even have to say. Now this is this is crazy one. Um, this is an 11th Circuit uh, labyrinth on a manuscript containing a map of the world, creatively depicting the island of Crete as a labyrinth. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? So uh, this mathematically perfect 11th Circuit four axis labyrinth soon became widespread in the manuscripts across Europe. And the four axis design was introducing the cross. Yeah. This is when we first began to see that. Um, many of the manuscripts still depicted Theseus and the Minotaur at their centers, an enduring theme for overcoming the power of evil. <laughs> So from the Seventh Circuit classical style, we now have a second distinct style, which is the uh, medieval Eleventh Circuit labyrinth. Uh, it has a striking visual symmetry. These medieval uh, labyrinths were also created, a few others were created in different shapes. Uh, this octagonal labyrinth is at Amiens Cathedral, and the labyrinth with the bastions in the corners is at Reims Cathedral, both in northern France. Does everybody know what bastions are? They're actually, it's from like a fort, uh, you know, military um, fortification uh, they would have. It's interesting to me when um, elements, architectural elements from military, the world of the military end up on the labyrinths, but there are a few other examples. Okay, this labyrinth on a rock uh, in Ireland, carved in a rock in Ireland from the early, med early medieval period, possibly marked the route for a pilgrim's path to a monastery. And this wall labyrinth was carved outside the entrance to the cathedral at Lucca, Italy, to be traced with the fingers, there we go, before entering the cathedral for worship. So here's an early version of a finger labyrinth. And 
Theseus is hanging in there because this <laughs> script over here along the side actually talks about the battle and Theseus and the great slaying of the Minotaur. So it's it's hanging in there. But I just think this is so interesting. It was on the exterior, and um, I just imagine all the, the hands, you know, that grace this labyrinth in following the path. This um, was a floor mosaic, um, typical in Italy around 1100, on the floor. So these are small, but i got to enlarge it one more time and show you what's... There they are. Theseus and the Minotaur are really going at it there. Okay, now in um, the early early 1200s, labyrinths began to appear on the floors of Gothic cathedrals of northern France. They were larger than the ones I just showed you from Italy, and they were clearly meant for walking, and they occupied the full width of naves. The most famous labyrinth at Chart, and it's the most ornate, and the only example to sur have survived this early phase of labyrinths in French cathedrals. This labyrinth was called the Path to Jerusalem because it allowed those who were unable to make the expensive and dangerous pilgrimage to the Holy Land to make a symbolic pilgrimage by walking the labyrinth. A few documents from this era describe an Easter celebration on the labyrinth in which the bishops and the priests make dance-like movements around the labyrinth passing around a gold ball, symbolic of the new life in the risen Christ. I have a hard time imagining that. <laughs> we don't know. There are just not a lot of records of, of the different ways the labyrinth was used in. Now, the center of the short labyrinth originally held a brass and lead plaque depicting combat between... <laughs> yep. Theseus and the Minotaur, alluding to the battle, of course, between good and evil. However, the plaque was removed around 1792 to be melted down into cannons for the French Revolution. <laughs> next week, next week, I'm going to be sharing uh, more details about all the symbolism in, in the shark uh, labyrinth. 